If not, I'll share. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But having seen yeah. screwed, enough screwed up democracies, I think there's, you know, maybe we should run a few. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe a Okay, hello, very good afternoon to you, everybody. My name is Desi Anwar, and it's a pleasure and honor for me to um, chair this session building around bottlenecks upgrading Asia's infrastructure. And for those of you who are new to Jakarta, a very great welcome to this city. And I think bottleneck is an apt way to describe this city. As a matter of fact, Jakarta is becoming one of those cities where we don't ever experience a rush hour. Every minute is the rush hour. And I have a, a fair notion why this uh, conference begins, uh, is held on the Sunday. It's because it's the only day where we can get anywhere actually on time and not be late. And also it's the one day during the week where Jakartans can actually enjoy the roads because some parts of the roads are actually closed for cars for a few hours. So. Um, everybody can actually go out and do <coughs> something else such as biking. Now, the thing about economic growth, especially in Indonesia, it has not been matched by infrastructure growth. As I've mentioned, the number of cars in the last four or five years have grown dramatically and it has not um, been served with the proper infrastructure. For example, we haven't, uh, even uh, Jakarta has not seen one single new road in the last decade. And the other thing is that if every year, for example, we celebrate what we call the Earth Hour, where cities switch off the electricity for one hour, we can be sure that every week somewhere in, in some part of the country, and even in Jakarta, we experience regular blackouts. And we mentioned that Indonesia is number two after the United States when it comes to social networking, such as Facebook and Twitter. And we actually have an exponential growth in terms of internet penetration. And yet, we are still downloading the internet in terms of kilobytes. And as we can see, the lack of basic infrastructure, whether it's a road or whether it's our connectivity, it's slowing down the growth, it's hampering our economy and it's a lot of time wasted, a lot of fuel wasted on the road, a lot of wasted productivity and it's costly for our growth. So you need more time, more fuel, more effort when the infrastructure could actually help to support this growth. So the session that I will be chairing this afternoon is called Building Around a Bottleneck, Upgrading Asia's Infrastructure and the question is how could Asian infrastructure be implemented so it will support growth rather than hamper growth? And I have with me six extremely distinguished panelists. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, the first one is Dominic Barton, Worldwide Managing Director, McKinsey and Company from the UK, and also the co-chair of World Economic Forum on East Asia. Dominic, welcome. And Ajit Gulabchan, all the way from India, Chairman and Managing Director of Hindustan Construction Company, Stuart Gulliver, Group Chief Executive of HSBC Holdings UK and also co-chair co of the WEF on East Asia, Madhu Koneru, Executive Vice Chairman, Minerals, Energy and Commodities from the United Arab Emirates, John Rice, Vice Chairman from G uh, General Electric Company, GE in Hong Kong, and last but not least, Gita Wiryawan, Chairman of Indonesia's Investment Coordinating Board. Welcome, gentlemen. My first question, perhaps uh, more pertinent for you, Dominic, as we uh, talk about the infrastructure policy, particularly in Asian countries. And what do you see are the main challenges that in the, uh, Asian countries are facing when it comes to implement, uh, implementing infrastructure policies? And, and what is the best way for governments in developing countries to actually plan out their infrastructure policies? 
Well, I think there, there's a <clears throat> quite a wide range of issues that are there and more qualified people than me to talk about it. For example, in the financing side, the long-term savings, pension funds, and so forth. Um, and then the people actually doing the, doing the construction and working with the government if it's a, a private-public partnership. What I'd just like to focus on is one specific part, which is more operational. And that is really around the uh, regulatory complexity uh, when you try and get something done. So when you look at things like land rights or land usage, uh, this can be a big bottleneck for people to be able to get it through. So if you are running a road that cuts across provinces or different jurisdictions, which we see in actually many Asian countries, and you have to negotiate with each local government as to what the rules are, that can be incredibly uh, frustrating in terms of how, of, uh, of how you work it. Um, I think that the, the, the second issue is around the prioritization. We know, as others again will speak, there's roughly between eight to ten trillion dollars of infrastructure that's required over the next ten years in Asia. The question is, how do you prioritize that? And, we're, and, and if you're going to go and want to do that with a particular government, what's first priority? What's on the rank order? And what you find in a number of the countries in Asia is there's a whole hodgepodge uh, of them that are there. Different interests have different views as to whether it's the power or roads or airports and so forth. So getting a very clear sense of priority is, uh, is key. And, and the, the, the third area is really around just the, the regulatory certainty that goes with this, which I think is a big issue. A lot of the infrastructure requirements are greenfield, not brownfield. And if you're a pension fund, that can worry you because you don't have anything to base it off in terms of looking at what true consumer demand is like, how many cars will actually go on that road, uh, how, how will pricing be done in that particular utility. And so we have a lot of greenfield requirements. So what's the arrangement that we can put in place that can help those funds that actually have a lot of money and do want to invest, I'm talking about outside uh, the country itself, have some certainty in terms of how they're going to be able to do that. And I, I think that right now I'm generalizing, but I would say across the region, except perhaps for some of the cities in China, where there's a little more clarity and certainty around it, it just takes too long and it's too complex to be able to get it done. You get too much of a headache trying to uh, work it through, and yet we need, we need to do it. And I would hope that we could have, if we could get a reference case, if I, if I was in a country and had the decision rights, if you will, to have a reference case to show how we can actually go from the idea to the design, the cooperation, and the implementation in a period of time, that I think would accelerate what we could be doing in other parts of the, of the region, but also in that country. Um, Dominic, certainly land issues, regulations, these are the problems that Indonesia is currently facing. Uh, but what advice would you give to uh, governments such as in Indonesia who are having you know, difficulties in actually implementing uh, those projects, what, and how would you recommend that they should prioritize? Well, that? one thing is, uh, on the prioritization, I have a feel, we'll hear from Gid, I think they're, they probably do have a good sense of, of, the, of the priorities. I think the thing is to take, as I said, a reference case, and if you will, fast track it. The problem is there's not a lot of best practices around the world. I can't point to a country that does this in, the, in an outstanding manner. Maybe some other colleagues can, but what I will say is there's two countries that are now going for it. One is Colombia and one is Chile. And the Colombians are basically saying, the president is saying, you come and, and we've fi figured out these priorities and we will work with you to figure out what all the bottlenecks are and where they are with the investors and all of the different players. And I think if we could focus in Indonesia on one or two sort of lighthouse projects and actually map out what it is that would be required, some changes may not be possible. For example, on the mm -hmm. land use, I'm not, I'm not sure again where, where the, what degrees of freedom the government would have. But if you can at least lay that out and have, every, have total awareness of where that is and a commitment, almost a fast tracking of trying to de bottleneck it, I think then we could move it. But I'd focus on one or two to get them right and then you replicate it as opposed to have a whole pile of them going at one time, which could be frustrating uh, a lot of people. But Colombia, they Colombia have and Chile. Land, the, do they have land issues? They have, they land have landed. They've got tons of. They've got security issues. How, how did they actually? Well, uh, the unfortunate thing is they haven't done it yet. They're doing it, if you will, and that's the. But there's a commitment. The President Santos has said we 
we, it's what it was you mentioned at the beginning, you're not going to get, they're trying to raise their GDP growth uh, by three percentage points. It's going to require infrastructure to do it. So he's got a whole communication program around, it's in all of our interests to be able to get this infrastructure done because we're all going to be better off. So there's a big communication program going on in the country to explain to people. And then they're just in the process now of, of, of driving it. But as I said, there's an, it's not done. It's just, there's just a commitment from the president to deliver, if you will, to drive it, to then be able to replicate it. And the same as in mm -hmm. Chile. The only thing I'd say that's different about Chile is the earthquake actually, I say this in all respect, actually helped because you've got to build hospitals and you've got to build schools and you've got to build roads in record time they were forced to and that uh, mm -hmm. led um, to some changes. I, I remember even uh, 10 years ago, you know, there's talk about you know, 10,000 kilometers of roads will be built around the country and 10,000 megawatts and so on and so forth. And, and until now, unfortunately, you know, the, the proof, as they say, is, is in the pudding. But Ajit, you're uh, from India, so the construction uh, infrastructure company, India. How do they do it in India? Also, which is an a, a extremely <laughs> high growth country with a huge population. I'm particularly interested, in, for example, in how to solve the the mass rapid uh, transportation system, which until now, unfortunately, Jakarta, even though it's a huge metropolis of 12 million people, we still do not yet have adequate, efficient uh, MRT. How do you do it in India? Well, India is a mixed story. You have grad successes at some end, and there are utter failures at the other end. We have some structural problems in the sense that our local self-government cities and towns are not managed by themselves. Whilst the states do, and there is a very strong central government, it's too large a country, and a lot of urban infrastructure is not getting built because it does not have powerful town and city governments. In addition to that, there are certain issues of certainty. Certainty of policy on environmental issues, on land acquisition, on some of the economic viability because what needs to be charged to a population that is not likely to pay adequately for the public services that infrastructure entails mm -hmm. do lead to an economic viability problem that remains unresolved. And these are issues that are bogging India down. Could, so could you give us some examples of those issues? For, for example, on one side, uh, we had a national highway authority that has been extremely successful. It created a new model of public-private partnership. And before this authority was put into place, we have, were doing 11 kilometers of, building 11 kilometers of roads per year. We came, down, came up to building 11 kilometers of loads per day because of a new kind of public-private partnership where barring the ownership of the roads, almost everything was done privately by outsourcing, including in most of the roads where investment would be private as well. Now, this was very successful. It runs into trouble from time to time. It slows down. But even when it slows down, we're still able to achieve about 10 kilometers of roads per day. And I think this has been a successful way of dealing with it because the infrastructure to be built is so much and so quickly, particularly because of the large migration to cities that we are now seeing. About 400 million people will expect to migrate to cities in India in the next 30 to 40 years, a migration that took place in Europe over a thousand years. And this kind of migration is very difficult to handle. So it does require more local self-governments to deal with it, a more certainty of regulation, which is very difficult because various constituencies of environment, of social equity, as well as financial viability, I mean affordability, are constantly at, at, at loggerheads with each other in trying to make sure that they are all incorporated into a project very often after the project is under implementation. This has caused a number of problems. Yet, as I told you, it's a mixed story of successes at some end, and lots of things that should have started 10 years ago are yet to begin. So is there overlap between, for example, local governments and central governments when it comes to building infrastructure? And, and you know, 
in, especially See, in terms of the funding constitution and of service India, regulation. The Constitution of India lays down very clear rules of the 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 air, I mean the, the what gov, what can be governed by the states and what can be governed by the central government. There are some concurrent lists, and they tend to overlap sometimes. But the fact remains that whilst this is the case, not enough authorities and autonomies exist with the states to be able to carry out their own programs because of the uh, imbalanced distribution of funds of taxes collected between the states and the center. And due to excessive centralization, which came with central planning soon after independence, there has been a tendency of central dominance, which then does not allow local self-governments to adequately grow on their own. Wherever they have been allowed, particularly after liberalization, we have seen some of the states grow at even growth rates of 14%. And that has been quite remarkable. But nevertheless, you will find, therefore, for every bad story in India, there is also a good story because it's substantially private sector-led growth, and it has been able to cope with whatever reforms have allowed it to do so, and has been able to overcome the shortcomings that are even prevalent in spite of lack of the government policies in certain Okay, things. Ajit, perhaps you could give us an example, for example. Is, is there an MRT in Mumbai? There is a, a mass what rapid system? transit system in Mumbai for the last uh, almost 70, 80 years. But that is woefully inadequate to the population of Bombay today. And it requires a much bigger system, a much wider network in order and to... And is that being to, built? It is being built for the last 20 years and not yet started. Okay, and for things like that, or maybe in, in other cities, for example, how long does it take uh, for a project, for example, no, for to example, get as I told you, off this, the ground? In this particular case, Bombay does not manage itself. It is subject to the state government of Maharashtra, of which Bombay is the capital. And that works with the central government, and particularly the railway ministry, in order to create this particular mass rapid transit system. Some of the states have taken up the model and begun their privatization, like in Andhra Pradesh, the Hyderabad mass rapid transit system is being, is being uh, 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 created by the state government for the city of Hyderabad through a public-private partnership process. And that has just begun. Similarly, Delhi had an example of two actually public sectors, that central government and the Delhi government, coming together, sharing 50-50 equity in a mass rapid transit system, or a local subway system for Delhi. So some such mixed uh, public sector undertakings working with each other in order to create that has been able to work because people are not willing to pay the kind of prices that economic viability of such systems demands and therefore calls for an element of viability gap funding or subsidies which only state-run units can give and therefore you have a success in Delhi it is like it is expected to be replicated in, in Hyderabad with, uh, on a completely private basis. Bangalore is looking at it. Uh, Calcutta is entirely a, a government of India undertaking. So we have a, a whole types of different types of models being worked out, but we haven't made the kind of progress Indian cities need. Okay. Um, Stuart, perhaps this is a good moment to actually talk about the financing. Obviously, building infrastructure is, is an expensive business. Somebody has to foot the bill, especially if you know, government budget doesn't stretch um, that far. And we've talked about private-public uh, partnership. And what would uh, you say about the best way of financing infrastructure pro projects? And what kind of return of interest uh, are we talking about that in investors are, before they are interested in financing such projects? It's, it, it's an interesting, um, the, the number that Dominic mentioned, 8 trillion US dollars of infrastructure spend, seems on the face of it a daunting number. Um, and here in Indonesia, the estimate is about 250 billion US dollars over the next five years if you're, if you're going to build your 10,000 kilometers of road and so on. But, but actually, if you look at it, Asia's got a colossally high savings rate. So there's a huge amount of private money, but it sits in the banking system and it sits in very short-term deposits. Asia's also got a colossal amount of reserves, 
which sit with sovereign wealth funds and central banks, and that goes and funds basically the debt of Western Europe and the United States. What the issue is, is of mobilizing funds. It actually isn't there's a shortage of money. Um, the Minister of Finance of Indonesia said on a panel that I was on this morning that the fiscal revenues or the fiscal receipts here in Indonesia can only fund about 20% of the requirement. But what you need to do is to mobilize the money that's around, which essentially requires the build out of really two things and, 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 and simultaneously. First of all, there needs to be a push to create a pensions industry and a, and a mandatory pensions industry. And then secondly, uh, alongside that, an insurance industry. And then you essentially develop bond markets because if you can get people to start saving in pensions and start saving in life products, then the maturity transformation is much easier because if you save in a pension, you're saving for 30 years, the pension fund manager can therefore lend 30 year money for someone to build a bridge, a power station, a road. As long as the money sits either um, in bank deposits and is therefore too short term for that maturity transformation to work within the banking system, and by definition, if it sits in US treasuries, it's not actually building infrastructure in Asia. So there's an issue of mobilization. There's not an issue actually of a shortfall of money. And there are several well-established techniques to deal with greenfield sites versus brownfield sites. And actually, if you're running a pension fund or an insurance company, project finance tends to be an extremely good way of diversifying your risk because project finance whether it's investing as a, a, an equity holder in a venture capital way, or it's a public-private partnership in a greenfield site, or it's a project bond, tends not to correlate uh, with equity markets. So it actually provides them with diversification. And actually, the two countries in, 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 in Asia, ex-Japan, that have done well with infrastructure are Hong Kong and Singapore, both of which have effectively mandatory provident funds, both of which have therefore created pools of long-term money and both of which therefore have been able to build world-class infrastructure very quickly. What they've also though managed to do is to clear all of the red tape to enable those to be built within short order. So I actually think the infrastructure requirement of Asia is absolutely fundable because the money is absolutely there. But unless that mobilization takes place, and that frankly is country by country, it's a domestic agenda because what you really want to do is to mobilize the domestic savings here in Indonesia not to be reliant on hot money that from time to time might want to come to Indonesia because QE is happening at the moment in America mm. and dollars are free. That gives you that long-term sustainable thing. So it's the creation of a contractual savings industry that's so critical. And both Hong Kong and Singapore did it by actually creating a mandatory requirement for people to save for their retirement. Uh, uh, which then has the beauty of providing you with the capital to build your infrastructure uh, and you create a virtuous circle. Uh, we, we have a lot of liquidity at the moment in Indonesia, like you said, the problem is not, um, it's not actually it, the amount of money, it's there, it, but it's, it's, it's the, Yes, it's mobilizing and the maturity which it's prepared to stay for. You know, if the money is there short term, it's not going to finance a 20-year project. All right, Stuart, you're from you know, HSBC and HSBC is you know, quite big in Indonesia. But how, how attractive is um, Indonesian's uh, infrastructure project oh, for think, a bank? Like no, no they would be completely attractive, but, but, but they can't be financed by bank financing. The roles that banks will play is as an intermediary. So we'll play a role in terms of pricing project bonds, we'll play a role in terms of the risk management of the projects, but the end investors have to be people who are prepared to take 20 or 30 year risk. And as I say, that's the life insurance industry, that's the pension fund industry. It's not your commercial banks. Your commercial investment banks will provide the advisory work you know, the project and export finance advisory to structure it, how to put the project bonds together, how to put the PPP partnerships together, but they're not the end investors. The end investors need to be done, and that requires a government initiative. And that government initiative itself is, tends to be a joint venture between government and the banking industry in a particular country. Uh, and again, both Singapore and Hong Kong have done this in the last 20 years. Okay, um, I'd like to turn to you now to Madhu. Um, MEC is an investor in Indonesia. Uh, if I understand it, is, uh, you're actually building a, a railway in East Kalimantan uh, to support the your coal companies there. Now, could you tell us, Madhu, perhaps as an investor, how, how is the project, the infrastructure project coming along? You're also building a power plant there, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, are there any sort of you know, difficulties in actually implementing the, the project? And perhaps you could share with us. Uh, sure. We are building a 140 kilometer railway track, uh, trying to link the energy to... Sorry, could you speak closer to the mic? Is that better? Uh, we are building a 140 kilometer railway track, uh, 
uh, that's primarily to connect the, the coal mines to, for export as well as to create uh, other industries within the region. Uh, hearing a lot of the uh, bottlenecks, what, what we have been discussing here about and uh, what experience we have is completely different. Uh, probably it's one of those projects which is on the good side of the story. Uh, we've been here for the last three years as a company, but uh, we, most of our people here, the way they settled and the way they work in the project is almost like we've been here for the last 30 years. I think a lot of the mistake, what a lot of the foreign investors do is when they land into Jakarta, they first go to the lawyer's office and try to understand Indonesia, which is a big mistake because the lawyers give you the completely wrong perception. They only talk the negative things of Indonesia. And whereas Indonesia is more about uh, what's happening on the ground. What we have done is we have, got, we have engaged the local government a lot. We've, got, we've engaged the local people. We've engaged the central uh, government people. There have been uh, three years back when we had asked bids for some, some of the contractors in the region refused to bid because they never believed this could ever happen. So then we had to engage the contractors with the local government and the regional government to build the confidence in. So it's all about the confidence of each one of those stakeholders because I don't think uh, a railway track can just be built by us. We can't just write one check and, and you know, start buying all the land and everything is done. There are various stakeholders in it. And the biggest job what we do in the process is that we try to engage all the stakeholders, make each one of them keep on meeting, that's how I have a lot of visitors per Gita's office regularly. I bring, I bring uh, uh, US exam, I bring uh, GE, I bring uh, uh, Standard Charter Bank, the banks, I bring the regional governments. I have introduced uh, international banks to the Bhupati in the region. I mean, you know, uh, Bhupati is just one of the regional leaders. We've taken to him, and he, the Bhupati hears what the bank wants from an international perspective, and then he tries to find solutions for some of the issues which are there. And then I bring the Bhupati back into Jakarta, make him sit with the central government and try to find a solution. And the, the, most of the uh, government who, uh, which is sitting in Jakarta understand international business. It is the local government which does not understand. So you've got to engage both of them. They feel comfortable with each other. Uh, the, the, we have land acquisition is one issue which we have, which we have been dealing it on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, this is like golf. You, know, you play shot by shot. Don't try to play all the shots in one shot. So we go piece by piece, one by one. Each and every department has got a different issue. You've got to handle them in that specific manner. The good thing in land acquisition is I can tell you, uh, probably it's in, in, in India and other places, the difference between Indonesia is that the difference in the political parties is during, only during the election time. When it comes to development and finding a solution, it really doesn't matter which political party the regional government is or the central government is. They, they don't really, they all meet and they talk. That's a good thing. Uh, you know. Uh, the second thing is with regard to the policies. Uh, letting you build your own private railway is the biggest opportunity you could ever get in the world. You can't do it in Australia, you can't do it in Colombia, you can't do it in the US. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity. There, there will be challenges going forward, but we see it as a big opportunity for us. There is nowhere else in the world, even in India, you build your own railway track, you build it and hand over it back to the government. So we see that as a fantastic opportunity, and we would like to... Uh, you know, get involved and, and uh, face the challenges rather than just running away from the, from the challenges. Coming to the, uh, uh, the approvals, uh, there's a solution for that too. There have been problems of approvals for, forever, but a couple of years back when I uh, sat with BKPM officials and I said, I will do the land acquisition, I will invest the money, but what are you going to do with the approvals? They gave me a confidence. Again, it's all about the confidence, what you build with each other and the trust you build with each other. I said, you carry on, we will, we will find you a solution. And as of last month, they have announced our project in the nine special corridors. If two years back or three years back, I was waiting for that announcement to come, we wouldn't have progressed where we are. Uh, we have been announced, our project is part of the nine special corridors where the president has given uh, instructions to all the ministries to give special clearances to these nine projects. And I think these nine projects have been selected on certain basis of certain development which is already done. So I think it's more of guys who are already committed, we push them first. And uh, we are getting our approvals, uh, may not be as easy as it is, but it's moving. It's always important to move, not just get stuck somewhere. And uh, it may move slowly because the country is big. Uh, so like I said, we have been here for three years, but we feel that we have been here for 30 years. We are very comfortable. We walk into any government office like any other local company. and. Uh, we are engaging the international financial community, different stakeholders in, with the local people and making them understand the different challenges and start accepting those challenges and start build trust with each other. 
So you're saying you're quite happy uh, with, with that kind of yeah, I'm process? Yeah, we're, we're very, very you happy. You don't want to see anything sort of change. But how long, how long did it take um, MEC to, uh, from the sort of the blueprint of the project until the, um, <coughs> the implementation? The blueprint was made in 2008, uh, first quarter of 2008. 2009, uh, second quarter, we got our railway license. And uh, after we got the railway license, we took us about one and a half year. We've acquired 95% of the land. Uh, one more thing is that we have not sat in Jakarta and kept telling the government, you buy the land, I will build the rail. We didn't do that because the government has got other things to do. They've got, you know, social security. They've got other things to run, run here. What we did was we went in on the ground, started engaging the local villagers, and started talking to them, showing them. We actually made an animated video of what the project will look like five years down the line if the railway was built. And these are our, our villagers who, when they see the video, they like it, they start supporting you. When you have villager support, automatically the government will support you. When you have the government support, not necessarily the villager will support you. That's the difference. So it sounds like a good example because land, uh, land clearance, land acquisition is, is one of the biggest problems in this country. You didn't have any problems with, with acquiring land or with... I think most yeah. of the land acquisition problems are in Jakarta, not in Kalimantan or South Sumatra. And I think there are opportunities in these regions also. The business is not only in Jakarta. The business is all over Indonesia. And you need to go into the uh, areas where there is not enough uh, competition or uh, probably it's because of the competition land acquisition becomes difficult not necessarily because of government policy. So I guess in Kalimantan or Papua or South Sumatra, there are a lot of opportunities in the region and not much competition, so you can attract, go into those areas. It's good. It's nice to uh, hear a positive um, example of infrastructure being built in, uh, in Indonesia. But if we talk about infrastructure of tomorrow, John, obviously when we build infrastructure, we hope to also build for, to solve the problems of tomorrow. And the problems that we have at the moment, especially with, for example, mm -hmm. the environment, with uh, getting clean water, in using renewable energy, and so on and so forth. And uh, you from, uh, because you're from GE, as a global company, what do you see the main challenges of building and financing uh, infrastructure of tomorrow? Well, I think we, if, if you think about it from our perspective, we, we have to keep investing in, in innovative technologies that bring the cost of delivering these capabilities to market lower and lower. So if it costs 90 cents a cubic meter to, you know, to take the salt out of water, we've got to figure out how to make it 80 or 70 cents. We have to, we have to figure out how to get affordable health care technologies to remote villages that don't have power. So that's a handheld ultrasound that is battery operated. It's, it's, it's all sorts of capabilities that didn't exist yesterday that, that some, of, some of them exist today and some will exist tomorrow and, and we can never stop doing that. Um, it's, it's also figuring out how to connect capital with these big infrastructure projects because, because there is lots of money in the world that is interested in investing. Uh, some of it can find projects easily and some of it can't and, and we have a responsibility to help with that. Uh, I, I really agree with what Dominic talked about in terms of government's responsibility to create a level playing field and establish rules that are consistent and allow you to see forward a couple of decades because if you're investing in these big projects you you don't want to think that the rules are going to change the next time the government changes and sometimes they do uh, and the fourth thing I'd say and this is not something that we talk enough about but and I like all of you I travel around a lot and I, I'm in a lot of countries where 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 the governments just don't know how to get big projects tendered. You know, it just takes too long. It's not transparent. And it, you know, you can have all the capital in the world you want. You can have great technology. But if you can't actually get the bidding process done, then you're not going to, then this, this, these trillions of dollars isn't going to get spent or it's not going to get spent soon enough. And, and that's where I think companies like GE and McKinsey and can help create 
procurement standards which give governments the confidence to move forward with these projects. Are you talking to the Indonesian government about this, for example? We talk to everybody about it. We, we talk to everybody about it because it, it's hard, it's complicated. These, yeah. The process gets politicized. Uh, so I, I don't want to be naive about it. It's not something you, you can do, solve. You do sound frustrated. But tomorrow, but it's true. It's, it's, and, and let me tell you, the Western governments don't necessarily have it figured out either. So it's, they, <laughs> <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't West versus East. But if you, I believe that there are great technologies which can be brought to bear to solve problems today. There's capital that wants to find these projects. We got to make the system, we got to grease the system a little bit to make it work better so that we can get some of this stuff done. Okay, I'd like to focus on the, the actual the types of projects that um, Indonesia, for example, should prioritize. You know, we talk about infrastructure, we also talk about you know, access to clean water, for example, and uh, power and so on and so forth. What, what would be sort of really good projects for Indonesia to prioritize? Well, <clears throat> well, I think distributed power is important in Indonesia. You have, uh, you know, people living on 6,000 islands. You've got 15,000 or some number in total. You've got an electric grid, which will be very difficult to reach all these people. Uh, and so power units in smaller block sizes for, you know, lots for remote villages, are, you know, perfect opportunities to solve that problem or at least help it while you're waiting to push the grid out to people who need it. And I don't think that's a, a problem that's unique to Indonesia. If you, if you look at, at Africa, you know, there's a billion people on that continent. Probably five or six hundred million don't have reliable access to power and it'll be a long time before the grid reaches them too. So it's a similar phenomenon. So smaller power block sizes, uh, 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 power blocks that can run on biofuels or non-natural gas, landfill methane and coal seam methane and things like that. All those technologies are available today and, uh, and, 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 and can be used to help. Um, like Gita, <laughs> last but not least. Um, by Gita and I, we've been on these sort of infrastructure sessions uh, quite a few times, and I always ask him the same question, basically. When is it going to happen, basically? And so what is happening with the infrastructure? And these, uh, you know, these are questions that I've been asking, you know, five, ten years ago. So tell us, by Gita, well, will we see, you know, new roads soon? We'll see... Uh, Five, Power plants being five years ago, I was on the other side of the panel, uh, and I was the one asking questions. Uh, look, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think many people have known me as an optimist, and let me continue being optimistic today. Uh, but before that, I want to I wanna just recap uh, some of the, the challenges that we go through. I think Stuart was was so correct in pointing out the limitation from a funding standpoint. And that's not just by virtue of the absence of a mandatory system to, for people to basically put money in a, in a bucket that would be you know, funneled to uh, long duration instruments. Um, you know, the pension funds and all the other uh, funds that are here in Indonesia, the local ones, particularly the state owns, their liquidity amounts to about 40 billion US. And a good chunk of that, if not most of that, is placed in, you know, no longer than 12 month deposits. Uh, not because, you know, these guys don't want to, but there is no proper instrument that would have been created to support the funding and the financing. And I think we're taking the view to basically change that. I'm not saying that things will brighten up tomorrow from a, from a funding instrument sta instrumentation standpoint, but I think something will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. Now, 
if we look at the regulatory side of it, I think uh, the one thing that would be a major value unleasher or game changer is the land law, which we haven't been able to get you know, in the last 25 years. And this land law is something that has been pushed to the parliament uh, in the last bit of December last year. And I've been called by parliament a few times to testify and give my views about the world and how that would be useful for Indonesia and Indonesians. And I think from a body language standpoint, they are, I think, leaning towards agreeing with how it should be done to make this you know, hospitable to the investing community from Indonesia and outside Indonesia. And I, I'm willing to wager a bet that this thing is gonna come out either in the third quarter or fourth quarter. The beauty about this is it's, it's that it's gonna you know, provide certainty with respect to timing and pricing. And that's exactly what business people need when they want to build roads, railroads, ports, power generation, and what have you. The third impediment thus far has been, you know, wanting to do too much with too little bandwidth. You know, that's, that's the temptation and the tendency for bureaucrats in any country. You know, they want to do too much in too little time. And the problem we've had in the last 12 years is, you know, when ever since we started talking about, and I'm a bureaucrat, by the way, so uh, 12 years ago, we started, you know, tinkering with the idea of PPP, public-private partnership, and nothing got done, you know, until recently. And eight or nine months ago, I made the point uh, very vocally to the cabinet that, you know, there needs to be some game changing here and there needs to be a separation between planning and execution. And guess what? We signed the MOU with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Planning. And I told everybody at the cabinet that, you know, I'm not interested at all in telling the world that we want to be promoting 50 to 60 different projects. I want to just be telling the world that we want to do just one project. And guess what? We were forced to come to a compromise of outlining or announcing five projects within the PPP basket. And one of the five got done two weeks ago for the first time in 12 years. And this is the central Java power plant, uh, power generation capability, two times 1,000 megawatts. This was, uh, you know, bidded by two Japanese and two Chinese. Uh, and this would have been possible mainly because the government took the view to basically provide a government guarantee, which, you know, the government had never wanted to give the government guarantee to anybody that wanted to do, to finance uh, power generation. So we did it. So we've, we've, we've delivered the baby. And the next one that we have gotten involved uh, with packaging and promoting and all that is the Umbulan water, water treatment project, which has been pending only since 1968, okay? This was just about the time when Sukarno was going down. And you know, Sukarno was the first president of the Republic of Indonesia. And we took over and we made sure we sat down with the Bupatis, the governors, the parliamentarians at the regional level, and of course, all the relevant ministers in Jakarta. And guess what? 29 expressions of interest from really reputable names from all over the world, and we've shortlisted the names to, I think, seven or eight. And this is highly likely to get done this year. So the message I want to convey is that, yes, it's, it's messy thus far, but there is hope because there is this little steps that we're taking. You know, we got to continue thinking big and doing small and doing now. And this is exactly what we're doing, and I have, I have complete confidence that we'll be able to get the two done this year mm -hmm. so that we can move on to the other three out of the five that we announced a few months ago. And the other five are basically the rail link between Mangarai to Sukarno Hatta and the toll road in uh, Kuala Namu to Medan. And the last bit is a, is a simple cruise terminal in Karangasam in Bali. I think Karangasam is a much more doable item. Uh, you know, compared to the other two remaining. Uh, and this, we've basically sat down with the Bupati of Karangasam. This is on the eastern coast of Bali. It's, it's a 40 to $50 million, you know, deal for a cruise terminal to be built. 
But this is something that has been highly, highly demanded by people in Singapore and Hong Kong who wanted to have a, a hub in the eastern part of Indonesia so that you know the travelers from the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific could see the beauty of the eastern part of Indonesia. I think this has got a good chance of happening. My point, yes, we're not building as many kilometers of roads as the Indians and the Chinese are. By the way, the Chinese came to Indonesia in 1992 to learn how to build toll roads. And we taught them, and guess what? Ever since then, they only built more than 70,000 kilometers of road. <laughs> and we've only built 500 kilometers of roads since we taught the Chinese how to do it. And it's, it's, per, it's predominantly because of the three impediments that I've outlined. But, you know, it's not an impossibility. It, it takes patience perseverance uh, for purposes of basically just sitting down in, you know, in some remote regions. And, you know, John aptly pointed out the tender regulations. You know what? After or at the same time with the promulgation of the land law, I think we'll be able to complete the revision of Presidential Decree 13. And this is the, the impediment because this decree basically tells people that anybody that wants to bid for a, an infrastructure project, we've got to receive uh, at minimum three bids. And this was cutely crafted by some really smart guy in the government many years ago. And guess what? Uh, we ended up getting 27 bids from you know, all the relatives and friends of every bureaucrat in town <laughs> with uh, no financial and technical wherewithal. Uh, in the end, we ended up not being able to deliver. I would rather get a bid or take a bid from Astra uh, or a GE, uh, you know, knowing that you know, there is no question whatsoever with respect to, uh, and of course with Ajit also, uh, who is uh, qualified, and Madhu, uh, with respect to their technical and financial wherewithal. Uh, as long as we know what this project is going to be worth, if it's going to be worth $100, and if they put in a bid at $101, so be it. Let's accept it, and if there is no other bids, get it done. What happened in the past 10, 15 years, we got so many bids, we couldn't get going, and we would review, 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 and we would go to the second round, and we only got two bids. You know, a drop from 27 bids to two bids, and we would review, review, and we would decide to terminate the whole, the whole process. You know, by that time, it's already eight years. Uh, that's the reality, because people don't have the understanding of how a typical transaction ought to be structured and how a, a particular package ought to be promoted to anybody who has keen interest in, in stuff like this. So it's happening. The small steps are being taken, and, and I think we will have an MRT in Jakarta before I die. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. So I hope that uh, answers, uh, addresses some of John's uh, frustrations. But uh, before I turn to the audience, let me just ask you one question about this, the, the land uh, issue uh, regulation or law. When this comes out, how? How will it work? How does it work? And how uh, basically do you it, get very, people very, to Very, very simply, land? it tells people that you go out there and try to do it yourself. Okay? But if and when you cannot succeed. Uh, this could be six or 12 months. We're, we're, we're in the process of setting the threshold, the timing threshold. The government will intervene and buy the land, take over the land, and buy law. So people will have to and will be obligated to deliver the land to the government at a price which will be sensible. And sensibility, I think, comes from some sort of a benchmarking which could be benched against the underlying tax base of the land or some mutually agreed upon price you know between the government and the private sector but this this is a much you know better you know uh, level than where we have been in the past 25 years and you think you're confident that it will work oh yeah for sure i'm you know i'm not worried about the money i'm i'm, I'm worried about you know people get it about indonesia indonesia fiscally has been so prudent you know, we can gloat to the Americans and the Japanese, the Italians and the Portuguese about how we've been prudent on our fiscal management, 26% debt to GDP ratio. We can gloat about our monetary, you know, uh, stability, uh, you know, having managed inflation in, in an ineffective and efficient way. 
we just need to tell the people that, hey, look, we've got some sanity in the way we process things. And that's what we're doing. Okay. I would now like to invite questions from the audience. Um, could you please identify yourself and who you would like to address a question to? And, wh and where's the mic? Um, anybody? Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Hi, my name is Vikas Porta. I represent GEMS Education. Um, I suppose this question is to Mr. Gulabchand and to Mr. Koneru in particular. Um, it's to do with, um, in the West in particular, when we speak about uh, bottlenecks in infrastructure, the issue that you've picked on is land rights. Uh, but we're often asked about climate change. Uh, and as manufacturing companies or infrastructure companies uh, in this part of the world, how much of a bottleneck is that lobby? Well, at the present moment, it is a very major bottleneck. Land acquisition and price and compensation for it for eminent domain is under a big question. Is this for a public purpose? When it is going to be finally managed and undertaken by private sector, are you handing over public property in the, under the name of eminent domain to a private sector investor? These are questions that are being asked and raised. In addition to that, India has one more complication. And that complication is we have what is known as agricultural land and non-agricultural land. Whenever land has to be used for other than agricultural purposes, its land use has to be changed. And the moment you change the land use, there is a legitimate question, then who should be the beneficiary of that change? The farmer whose land it has been changed? Should it be the developer who is coming in to develop that new infrastructure project? And then should it be the government who is obliged to provide the infrastructure to make sure that this land becomes usable? These are questions that are still not getting adequately answered. Some piecemeal answers to finding a price for it have come up, but it has never remained satisfactory because it does not really answer these questions. Besides, there is land needed for more industry. And how do you acquire for industry? That should it be under eminent domain? And if not, then how does industry get new land? These are issues that are today really on the debate in India. And some legislations have been passed by, say, for example, the UP state government. The central government, it is begging this legislation and still not come through with it. And therefore, I think we are going to be in the midst of this turmoil of this debate over the next year or so, at least, before we come down to a conclusion, what would be the fair price of land, particularly, and for what should it be fully acquired by government, and what should be left for entirely private sector to do. So it's not a simple problem. It needs to be resolved. It needs to be done, but it has to be constitutionally acceptable. It has to be acceptable to the public at large that it was fair. And these are some of the issues we face. And that the land values after such new infrastructure coming in changes so much that even the farmers who have sold it 10 years ago want to come forth and say, we got a price that was much less than we should have got. We should also be made beneficiaries even though we sold this land long ago. So these are issues. Of course, this is wrong. But the fact is that we did not know this was going to happen. There was no laid down policy. This is how it will be done. And then the courts tend to hear their pleas. And therefore, we have a question here. And I hope that in the next, uh, next year or two maximum, we would be able to come to some policies. This is again compounded by the fact that there's a central subject and land is a state subject. But getting agreements here are not easy. But the fact is, Ajit, you still get one kilometer of road per day built in India. So well, how, but that's a lot of, as I said, it's a mixed, there's a, look, he, if he's an optimist, I'm an incorrigible optimist. I continue to invest in construction, concessions, and in city developments, in spite of being a victim of all the problems I've said. So the fact is that it still goes on. 
India is an optimistic story, but it does have these problems. Mm -hmm. well, questions, please. Yes. Uh, good day. My name is, Den is Denham. I'm, I'm from a company called SNC Label and out of Canada. We, are, uh, we invest in infrastructure concessions around the world. And in fact, we are an investor in India in both the Mumbai Metro uh, Phase 2 uh, uh, MRT project and uh, most recently a road project in India. And we find India has greatly improved. If you look at the, the, land, the land issue, the road we invested in was under, under federal law, where the federal government uh, guaranteed that 80% of the land would be available at financial close and that the balance of 20% would be available within 30 or 60 days of financial close. And these are the kind of guarantees that are required to bring in uh, investors like us. Uh, we find, look, looking around the market, that there are countries that are ad hoc. You know, they, the deals come out and they're, they're structured every which way. There is uh, countries like Brazil that have structured their terms and conditions of their concession agreements to favor national, national firms. They really are not... Uh, uh, tailoring them for international investors and then there are countries like India that have made a big effort in power and in roads to attract the uh, infrastructure investors like us and also the big pools of uh, fund money, the Macquarie's of the world and so on, to come in and uh, participate in the larger projects in India. And I, I think uh, my advice to countries is this is what you have to do. You have to be benchmark your practices against other countries. Uh, if you look at a port project, we'll get a port project uh, on, on a given day, uh, a port project in India, a port project in Indonesia, and one in Peru. And we were basically comparing jurisdictions to see which offers the best risk-return ratio, and that's where the money goes. And uh, really, this kind of benchmarking is, 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 is very important, and perhaps something like the World Economic Forum can even help countries benchmark their best practices, benchmark their terms and conditions and help them tailor them to really attract in, uh, attract in the, mm -hmm. uh, the big pools of international money which, which are out there. And we're, we're, you know, there, there is plenty of money for infrastructure out there if the risk return uh, equation is right. And I, I must admire Chakraborty Commission in, in India, uh, Minister Kamal Nath, who among other things decided that you know, people have okay. to make money. If in infrastructure is going to work as a private investment, the investors have to make money. Okay. And one, you know, once that gets accepted, well, that, that, that does uh, light the way for a lot of the changes that have to be made in the, in the uh, terms and conditions of these concessions. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Any of the panelists would like to uh, respond to the comments? Uh, yes. With regard to uh, the practical side of the countries like India, Indonesia, is that you need to get that one story right, the first one. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, again, I'll give our project as an example. When the license uh, regulation for private railways was issued in 2009, uh, we were the, one of the first people who applied, we got it. But there was no second application until first quarter of 2011. In first quarter of 2011, there are three projects which have been announced, one in central Kalimantan and two South Sumatra. All three of them are private. Uh, most of the investors were primarily waiting to see how our project is developing. Once the project was, uh, they've seen that there's a, there's a progress in our project, they all have started applying. So right now there are four private railway licenses which are being developed in Indonesia. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Um, my name is Fauzi from Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, my question to, to any, anyone from the panel is that uh, Many of the existing investors in infrastructure, uh, the, uh, for example, the, the private uh, operators of uh, tap water or ports, have issues regarding the flexibility of tariff, i.e., when they, they come in, they thought that raising tariff over the next 10 to 20 years uh, throughout the uh, uh, BOT period would be relatively straightforward, but it's not and they get frustrated and the projects uh, often uh, become underwater and and how can we ensure that that investors who come in uh, have that kind of flexibility or certainty on how to raise tariffs in the future um Gita? Yes, sure. Look, I, I think this is this is a great uh, question because uh, it is highly relevant to a lot of the investors that have invested particularly in the port uh, sector, uh, container terminal and all that. As, as much as we are keen on giving the certainty that at least there is not going to be any declination of tariff, 
you know, this is a politically sensitive issue, which, you know, the Ministry of Transportation would have to run by the, the parliament. And typically parliamentarians uh, are the ones that are gesturing and conveying the sensitivities with respect to, you know, the elasticity uh, of, of, of this new pricing mechanism. Uh, but this is all going to, you know, not disappear, but I think going to come down as the economy grows and as purchasing power uh, grows and welfare grows and widens. Uh, and it is happening already in Indonesia, you know, by virtue of the, the yardstick of poverty index and unemployment index and the GDP size and all that. I think going forward, uh, we may not have much or as much an issue as we have had the past 12 years. We, we privatized a port in 1999, okay, to uh, a large conglomerate based in Hong Kong. And I know when they came to Indonesia, they would have wanted us to, to give some kind of an assurance that tariff would be recalibrated every, you know, so, so and so years, uh, upward, not downward. Uh, and this, this made life difficult for a lot of the policy makers because, as you know, the early part of the last 12 years were very, very difficult times for us economically from a fiscal and monetary standpoint. But I think going forward as the economic pie grows, I think uh, we would be in a better position to at least assure that there is not going to be any, uh, you know, not as much sensitivity uh, on, on raising tariff going forward. Having said that, we're not in no position, we're not in any position to, to basically give certainty on uh, a periodic, uh, you know, tariff hike, you know, uh, that perhaps some investors have voiced. Yeah. Dominic, would you like? Oh, or sure. sure. Um, the only thing I would add, I, I would agree, obviously, with what Gita is saying, but I think it gets to me back to this brownfield, greenfield issue again, too, which poses uncertainty. One idea may not be a very good one, but we've often wondered if you got a group, the Asian Development Bank, or the world, and this can work in some countries, which comes in as a small part player, but because they're involved in other loans, that there's some surety that they're not, the investors that go with them are not going to be affected. Uh, by something, because what people worry about is would the government change? I think that's the issue. Mm -hmm. And is there some way to put some sort of a, a guarantee in that? Um, again, uh, there's all sorts of issues probably with that, but that, that I think is a big uh, factor, because who can tell who's going to come into government? And, and as everyone's been saying, it's 20 to 30 year money that could wreck the value from it. John? You know, it strikes me that there's a kind of a tension here between capital that can go anywhere and needs to have the right risk adjusted return to come here with some view that that's going to last for more than 18 months <laughs> and the perception that can be created that this is about rich people getting richer and rich companies getting richer and and wealth being exported to other places and so for all of us that do work in developing countries, we've got to deal with that perception. So you, you know, for us, we, we have to think about bringing in local capabilities and creating, whether it's training or, or service or manufacturing, because that's our way to avoid the perception that, you know, this is about us selling expensive power equipment or locomotives and making shareholders wealthier and other countries. And so we've got to, all the investors, I think, that work in a country like Indonesia have to deal with that perception. And we, and we all want to make a good return on our investment and, and satisfy our shareholders. So it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate tension that we see in, in lots of countries. But what, what are you actually you know, doing in order to perhaps change that perception or we have to be local. We, we can't, 20 years ago, you could fly in and sell a jet engine and leave and ship your engine in and get paid and live happily ever after. And that day doesn't exist anymore. We, we have to be working with Garuda on, us, on service. We have to be, have, have capabilities to, to assemble and service locomotives. We, 
that that has to be done increasingly that has to be done here not someplace else because for us to be successful we have to be viewed as a at a citizen of Indonesia not a global company uh, trying to export wealth quite frankly I, I think it's also it's exactly the same point but expressed in a different way it's also why you want to develop your domestic capital markets because whilst you absolutely want international investors like yourself who are reviewing Peru, South Africa, China and Indonesia on the same day, you want a raft of people who are Indonesian. Basically, the investor of last resort in any country is domestic and it tends to be its domestic insurance and pension fund industry. That domestic investor is going to have greater empathy with the local situation. It's also, from a positive point of view on your point about tariffs, going to be able to influence through the normal local processes, the change in attitude towards those tariffs in a way that's not seen as predatory and foreigners benefiting. So the development of domestic capital markets is really critical to sew both of these pieces together. And how do you see Indonesia's domestic capital market sort of, uh, developing in the last few years? I, I, I think that, that there's absolutely a recognition, and I think it's clear from what you were saying, that that needs to take place. And, and there are obvious poster children for this around the rest of Southeast Asia. So, so I, I, I think to some extent one's pushing on an open door, but you shouldn't underestimate the degree of difficulty of putting together the entire infrastructure to do it. One more question. Go ahead. Oh, Can I sure. Ask? Look, I mean, if, if we take a look at our market cap, the stock market, it, it, it is at about, what, 380 billion US. Compare that with our GDP of 720. It, it runs at a you know ratio of one to two or fifty percent you know compared with with the US you know the ratio is one to one because their market cap is you know around 14 trillion to a GDP of 14 trillion which tells everybody that you know there's still a lot of upside here to go and and that would have to involve you know encouraging as many companies as possible to get listed and as to to encourage more liquidity uh, from some of the stuff that we've talked about earlier. And if there is one thing that you all can do to help, you know, further enhance the investment thesis of Indonesia, it's education. And I think you guys, you know, from the corporate side of the game, uh, should really be proactive in looking to support uh, government in Indonesia uh, and that that could mean you know sending a government official for a two-week program somewhere what you want is for these guys to see the world you do and this is exactly how we've been doing it you know I've been in the private sector for a long time and you know when I go to Papua when I sit with the governor of Papua or the Bupatis of Papua they don't read the Wall Street Journal and they don't see the way I mean the world the way I see it uh, but it is it, the, the burden of proof is on me to make sure that they get it the way you get it. And, and it, it, it can only accelerate the mediation, the bridging of the two sides. And I, I tell you, it's going to boil down to how the regional leaders are going to view, you know, on some of the infrastructure projects that are going to have to be built in their regions, you know, even if we have a land law, but if they don't understand the land law or the implementation of the land law the way we want them to, it's still going to be a stymieing factor. So I think education is key. Well, here we have one. Wow, more questions. Um, let's just gather three at the same time because we, we don't have much time. There's a gentleman there with your question, and then a uh, gentleman over there, and then we have a third one. Yes. Sure. Thank you, Sandeep from Barclays Capital. Well, we've talked a lot about Asia and infra the need for infra infrastructure here. But if you looked at the U.S. and the West, New York hasn't seen any significant uptearing of their infrastructure for a long time, or the U.S. Is there an opportunity, and to Stuart, to your point, there is the, mobile, there is the capital from Q QE2, there are the institutions, the pension funds, the insurance with the longer-term capital. Is there a huge opportunity within the infrastructure world to uptear infrastructure in the US and will it happen? I think that the, uh, the kind of sweet irony in all of this is that a number of the Asian sovereign wealth funds are looking exactly at this which is investing in the infrastructure of the United States so I think there's a sort of a political or design issue within certain Asian governments as to where actually they want their surplus funds to go 
because um, that really is happening and that really is getting studied and yes that will be an area in which capital is put to work and, and, and there's a substitution level both at the Asian Sovereign Wealth Fund but also in terms of other, other investors in the sense that you have got several of the issues that have been talked about in terms of legal certainty, title to land, all of that is actually quite straightforward. Um, but yeah, the, the US, one of the ways the US will stimulate its economy and create a whole load of jobs of people earning fifty dollars to $100,000 a year is rebuilding its infrastructure. My name is uh, Pierre Cohad. I'm the president of Good Year for Asia Pacific. And I would like to uh, bring a testimony about the work that BKPM and, and the GITA are doing uh, in Indonesia. We have been doing business in this country for 76 years. We opened back in 1935 one of the first large-scale manufacturing sites in Bogor. And ever since, we have expanded it and modernized it. Today, we make workless tire that are exported in 52 countries, including in China which demonstrate that men in Indonesia can compete in China. Um, it is a 24-7 factory. Uh, the challenge we face is for the past seven or eight months, we are losing power one and a half day on a monthly basis, which means that we lose power about 5% of the working days we have. Um, and uh, if you think about rubber, hot rubber, it sticks. So when we lose power, um, it takes us a long time to clean some of the uh, pieces of equipment uh, that we have. Um, we are waiting for the power station to, to, to come up in line. It has been suggested to us that we put some co-generations, run some massive diesel generator, which are very noisy, um, oil thirsty, and of course it's not too good for the carbon footprints. So we cannot wait until the uh, PPP comes on board, and uh, clearly if you think about uh, what a 5% loss in the top line with the gearing does to your bottom line, there is a lot of incremental jobs and tax revenues coming to Indonesia once we can have guaranteed supply and power. Look, I mean, uh, we've, we've crafted this plan for the next five years to basically build 20,000 kilometers of roads and 10,000 megawatts of power generation or 15,000 megawatts of power generation, translating to 3,000 megawatts per year. And railroads, ports and airports for which we estimate, you know, we'll be spending about 160 billion U.S., of which we have allocated fiscally about 60 billion U.S. So right there, the delta of 100 billion would have to come from the private sector. And that money ain't going to come until and unless we get our act together in packaging the transaction. And I do believe with the recent development on power generation in central Java, I think we'll be able to deliver the 15,000 megawatts. And I think you can start planning on building more factories in Indonesia. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to wrap up here as um, we've run out of time. And apologies to those who want to ask questions but don't have the time. But um, uh, lots of issues, lots of challenges when it comes to implementing uh, infrastructure. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Um, we still have to fix the regulations, the land issues, the financing, and develop the domestic capital market as well as educate our local government officials. And with that, I would like to close the session. Big hands to our panelists, Dominic, Madhu, John, Gita, Ajit, Stuart. Thank you very much. I hope it's been useful. Enjoy your stay in Jakarta. Thank you. <laughs>